This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show number 262. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What is going on, everyone? My name is Brandon, your host today of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my wonderful, fantastic, amazing co host, Mindy L. Jensen. Is that really your middle oh. name? I just made that up. No. It's Dang it. Oh, let me get. Sue. Oh, Mindy Sue. That's actually like a, like a name. We should call you Mindy Sue. That's a name. That's that, not a name. That's like There's a... <laughs> one person on the planet named Mindy Sue as like one word. Mindy Sue sounds like you're like I don't know. You live out in the country and you're like a country bumpkin and you got freckles or something. I don't know. What's up, Mindy I Sue? I do have freckles. You I do. do have freckles. That is the only part of that that is true. You need pigtails and an overall and overalls that would make it complete. Anyway. Real I'm estate. Slightly too old for that. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about real estate instead. All right. So welcome to the podcast, guys. Uh, today, uh, Josh is not here, as you can tell by the higher feminine voice of Mindy. Uh, and so he Slightly missed out, higher. though. Slightly higher. He missed out, though, because today's episode is one of my favorites. I know we probably say that all the time. But uh, for personal reasons, this show is one of my favorites. You know, we talk a lot about, about mobile home parks today, uh, which I am a big fan of. Mindy, do you know why? Um, is it because you're buying a mobile home park in Maine? I totally am buying a mobile home park. However, listen, guys, if you are not uh, into mobile home parks, that's okay because today's show, like almost everything can apply to not mobile home parks as well. We talk about landlording. We talk about uh, you know, finding deals. We talk about developing relationships, growing your team, raising a fund, which was a fascinating topic that we've never talked about on the show before, but how to actually like, build a fund to go out and buy lots of deals, which is really cool. So this was a really great show. I learned so much, not only because I am also buying a mobile. Home yes, park, you are. By the time we this episode airs, we should be closed on our joint venture mobile home park in that this great state of Maine. That is true. Uh, do we want to say it's a three way venture? Yeah, we yeah. mentioned Ryan. Yeah. It is a I don't know. Three way sounds weird. It is a <laughs> tri venture. Tri, tri, me and a Mindy. Tri partnership. Yeah, Mindy. Well, and Carl. Well, Carl and Heather. We could call it a five way partnership. But either way, Ooh. Mindy. Uh, we did not actually talk about the show because I didn't know if I if uh, if I, Mindy wanted me to publicly talk about it. But yeah, Mindy is actually partnering with me on the mobile home park that I'm buying. So Mindy, this was a good episode for you and I to, to do together. I'm glad that you were able to be here. I am too. I'm really glad that Josh is a slacker. And I know. Off- playing hooky or whatever gallivanting gallivanting that was the word i was thinking of in my I head under- i understand when i was waiting to do this with you that's because we're partners um, now so we have the same mind that's how it works oh look at that yeah. i see you Pretty I, exciting. I, okay all right so, anyway so today's guest uh we'll get to that in just a minute but before we do i believe mindy you have a quick, quick tip, tip. Today. I do. Right, so it. I spend all day, every day on the Bigger Pockets forums, and I get a lot of messages from people who say, Oh, I've been listening to the podcast for decades, but I didn't know you had a website or a blog or whatever. <laughs> so today's quick tip is Do you know that Bigger Pockets has a blog? The podcast only comes out once a week, but we publish three to four articles on the blog every single day. Day. Three to four. That is a lot. And sometimes they're Mindy's, and sometimes they're mine. Sometimes they're Mindy, sometimes they're Brandon, sometimes they're written by people who know what they're talking about. That's true, sometimes. <laughs> in fact, they are written by investors who are out there in the investing world every day. You can learn from their experiences rather than from the School of Hard Knocks. I am a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks. Let me tell you, it's the lessons stick with you, but they really hurt to learn. That they do. So you can go to the Bigger Pockets blog at biggerpockets.com slash re news blog. Do you know you can and, also just go to bl- slash blog, FYI. That'll redirect there. Just slash blog. You didn't really? know that. Yeah, now you know. Oh my goodness. The more you know. Bonus quick tip. Yeah, bonus so, quick yes. tip. Biggerpockets.com right. slash B-L-O-G. If you go to B-L-O-G-S, that those are member else. written blogs. Yes. yes. We are that. talking about the main Bigger Pockets blog, there you go. which has, what are we up to, like 9,000 articles? Yeah, if you, like that. Another thing I hear all the time is, oh, I can't get enough of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Oh. Totally understand you. This, you can learn more <laughs> about real estate investing reading that blog than you can just about any other place, except, of course, the podcast. That's true. That's what we're doing right now. 
Well, good job, Mindy. Nice job on the on the not so quick tip today. Not so quick tip. No, right. when you want a long story even longer, have Mindy tell it. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's move on. And with that, I do want to, before we actually introduce our guest, I want to say something cool. Uh, we are recording this episode. <laughs> I know, I don't say things very cool. I want to say something cool. No, you're going to like this, Mindy. So we don't, uh, we are recording this episode before, like before, actually even before Christmas, technically. Um, but this comes out here in the middle of January. So by the time you're listening to us, we have actually launched another podcast at Bigger Pockets, And it is a <gasps> podcast we hosted have? by Mindy. Mindy Jensen oh here. Goodness. You have your own podcast with Scott Trench. So tell us real quick. You got eight seconds to tell us. Go. Eight seconds. Oh my goodness. Okay. Now six. So one you got of like three the most seconds popular left. questions. Er, all right. Frequently. Oh my goodness. So okay. Okay. You got eight more. Sh- you got eight more. Go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> one of the most frequently asked questions in the Beggar Pockets forums Beggar at BeggarPockets.com. Pockets. Sounds like you said Beggar, Beggar Pockets, which is an interesting title of a site as well. But anyway, Ooh. keep going. Wow. Shush. <laughs> this is my time, not yours. All right, do if it. If I recall correctly, you dominate the first part of I the do. podcast with a all of your chunk questions. Of it, yes. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Shh, shh. Okay. So, one of the most frequently asked questions in the Bigger Pockets forums is how do I get started investing in real estate with no money and bad credit? And while you, Mr. Brandon Turner, wrote a delightful book called The Book on Investing in Real Estate with No and Low Money Down, I don't think that it's a really great idea to start investing in real estate if you have absolutely no money and terrible credit. So Scott and I just are personally involved in the personal finance community. We're really passionate about teaching people about their finances. So we decided let's start a podcast called Bigger Pockets Money. And we're going to teach you how to get your money all fixed. We had an amazing first guest, Mr. Money Mustache, was on episode one of the Bigger Pockets Money Show, which launched on January 1st. And I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to uh, what's coming up in the future. We've recorded several shows in advance, and we're going to teach you about budgeting. We're going to teach you about uh, controlling all the aspects of your finances so you can get your financial house in order and start building your financial future. Wow. Well, Way longer than eight seconds. That's that was a lot longer. So for those people who are still here, let's get to today's show. Actually, <sighs> because I, I your show is fantastic, and Mr. Money Mustache is one of my favorite people on the planet. So go listen to those uh, those episodes if you've not yet. Uh, you can get to it by going to biggerpockets.com slash. What do you think, Mindy? We can name it right here. What's the show called? It's the Bigger Pockets Money Show. Okay, so biggerpockets.com slash Money Show. There we go. I'm gonna you can get to it by going to biggerpockets.com slash money show. You heard it here first, folks. All right. So today's show uh, is amazing. Like we said, we're actually bringing on a repeat guest. His name is Jefferson Lilly. He is actually the original inspiration for me wanting to get into mobile home parks, which is now me and Mindy have now bought one, which is awesome. And uh, we dive into a lot of stuff, like I said earlier, but uh, Jefferson is just crushing it. Him and his partner have bought like, what, 2,600 pads right now? Like mobile yeah, home Yeah, something spaces. crazy like that. Yeah. Like, including one that's 500 lots in one yeah. park yeah crazy or, no that's two parks well, two but, parks, still, yeah. like, but still it's like insane. right next to each other that's yeah, crazy yeah they're doing and, and again this applies to anybody whether or not you're looking at mobile home parks or multifamily or commercial or whatever uh this stuff applies to all of that so without further ado being the longest introduction in bigger pockets introduction history uh let's get to today's show jefferson welcome to the bigger pockets podcast again good to have you back uh thank you brandon it is great to be back yeah, well, today we don't have Josh with, you know, so you can't make fun of him like last time, but, you know, we got Mindy Feel here. free to make fun of Brandon as much as you'd like. <laughs> you can, you can. <laughs> so, interesting backstory. So, when you were on the show back, uh, what was it, February of 2000? February 15, I All think, right. yeah. So, you came on to talk about mobile home parks, and I had never known anybody who had ever done a mobile home park before, and I was like... Man, that sounds cool. And uh, <laughs> over the next couple of years, we interviewed a couple more people who do mobile home parks, and every time I'd be like man, that sounds cool. So um, in like three weeks, I'm closing on my very first mobile home park. So, uh, Man, that sounds yeah. cool. Yeah, that does sound cool. So now I get to find out if you were just, you know, full of it or if it really is cool. We've got you drinking the Kool-Aid, Brandon. That you do. So thank you for the original inspiration to the mobile home park thing. And now uh, today's show, selfishly, I get to pick your brain on how to make this actually a profitable investment. So that'll be fun. There we go. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I could. Uh, but before <laughs> we get about that. it, how many, yeah. how many pads? Is it yeah. city water? Is it city sewer? It Tell is. me you didn't buy in Maine, though. That's the one state. <laughs> you heard. <laughs> you Tell heard. Me, where's your part, Brad? 
<laughs> yes, it is in Maine. And oh, yes, no. I, I know Mindy must have told you that. So, uh, yeah, it is a 46 uh, spot park, uh, city sewer pad. and pad, pad park, yeah. um, pad, spot, whatever. Uh, it is water, city water, sewer, uh, right. and garbage. Uh, it's also uh, separately, you know, separately metered. So all the tenants just got shifted over to doing their own utilities. Right. Uh, we'll, I'd say it sounds like about half of them have done the shift, but they've all been converted. So the other half I need to convert over. Um, half of them are park owned. The other half are currently tenant rented or okay. uh, park. So park tenant owned, owned, tenant yeah. owned, resident, yep, owned, resident owned. owned. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we bought it for 1.1 million. Uh, okay. And the guy carried 80% of the oh. thing with seller financing on a, yep. th- was it 25 year no balloon payment, 5% interest. So that's how nice. everything worked out. Yeah. So that sounds like a great park and certainly a great first park. Yes. I think it's a good, it's a manageable, manageable size. And uh, the numbers look solid, especially there's like eight units that are vacant right now. Or, well, I think it's like four pads empty and then four uh, houses empty. Uh, so once we get all of that up and running, it should be a really, really good park. I think I projected like a 20 something percent uh, cash on cash return each year. Yeah. Uh, once it's up and running. So. Feels pretty good there. So anyway, good for you. Yeah. How'd you find it? Uh, actually, telling every single person on earth that I was looking for one, <laughs> and then uh, my buddy Ryan Murdoch, who was on the Bigger, Bigger Pockets podcast, he actually uh, got the lead from somebody he had bought a house from before or property before, and yep. hit me up, and then we ended up doing it that way. So, and Ryan's actually being a partner in the deal. So, oh great, yeah. And I'm bringing right. in another partner as well, another money partner, who's going to actually be funding the money side, or at least a good chunk of the money side of it. So yes. <laughs> it all in all worked out really, really nice. I, at least I hope so. So anyway, enough about me. This is not about my interview, but uh, yeah, let's talk about, uh, before, we, before we go even any further, a lot of people are like, mobile home parks, come on, I don't want a trailer park. I don't want, like, that's, <laughs> that's, that's horrible. I'm not going to ever do it. Why would somebody, and I know we covered this last time, but let's yeah. rehash it. Why would somebody ever consider investing in a mobile home park? Uh, so I want to jump in and say that before we ask Jefferson, let's remind everybody that Jefferson was on Bigger Pockets podcast oh. episode 111. So you, you can go. get there by going to biggerpockets.com slash show 111. All right. Now, Jefferson, now, I listened to your homework? show on the way in today. Oh, and great. yeah, why would anybody want to buy a mobile home park? That's where all riffraff. Yeah. The riff- <laughs> so, they, that's a great word. That's where all the riffraff lives. Yeah. Uh, so... You know, there are a couple of reasons. First off, mobile home parks uh, do get, I think, an undeservedly bad rap. Uh, Sure, there are some bad mobile home parks, uh, but frankly, there's some some bad regular neighborhoods with site-built homes. There's some bad apartments. Uh, I don't think it's particularly, uh, uh, you know, worse in mobile home parks. It's just that for whatever reason, that seems to be all that the media covers is the bad news coming out of a small number of mobile home parks. Um, It's just not news to send a reporter into a mobile home park and say, you know, like, hey, everyone paid their rent this month and the kids down the street are playing in their tricycles and the lady's planting begonias there in front of her mobile home. That's never going to leave this park. Okay, back to you for the 10 o'clock news. That's not newsworthy, but that's the reality for you know 99% of mobile home parks 99% of the time. So just the fact that they have a bad reputation means the smart money is not chasing these. So right there, when you don't have a huge number of buyers probably the pricing is is relatively low. So that's one reason right there. Um, another reason is the repair and maintenance. Uh, and Brandon, as you said, you've got a park with at least half resident-owned homes. I would encourage you for the other half to put those on rent-to-own agreements yep. and basically backpedal out of those homes. Don't You probably don't have to sell them at a great loss, but you don't really make a lot of money in the homes and and repairing all the proverbial leaky toilets and leaky roofs. Yep. So once you get down to what we call really just a parking lot where you don't own any of the homes, uh, first, you you know, you've helped deser- deserving folks become homeowners, and that's a good thing. Uh, but secondly, they're then taking care of all those proverbial leaky toilets and leaky roofs. 
And lo and behold, when you give a renter a path towards home ownership and they, again, become a homeowner, they don't treat it like a renter anymore. You're not somehow doing something evil, shifting all the repair and maintenance burden on it. It's just that you know, the, the tenants take better care. And if there's the, the leaky toilet flap for 12 bucks that can be repaired, they're going to go buy that flap at, at, you know, at the hardware store and repair it. It would cost you, the landlord, 120 bucks to send in a plumber to do it. Anyway, so the repair and maintenance costs are dramatically lower. You just maintain the land, which basically means mowing and, and snow shoveling for you up in Maine. It'll mean snow shoveling, lots, Brandon. Lots of that. <laughs> Um, and some sewer on stops, but it's not that expensive to maintain land. Probably 60 or 80 percent of most repair and maintenance budgets, say for an apartment building, go into the improvements, what's above the ground, not the ground itself. So repair and maintenance budget is low. And then thirdly, folks generally don't move the mobile homes. It costs, call it four to six thousand to move a mobile home. So they're not likely to do that. Um, so you have very stable tenants. The tenants own these homes, and because of the cost to move them, they stay a really long time. So your turnover costs are lower. Your revenue is a bit higher because you have less vacancy. So anyway, there, there are three reasons right there. Oh, I'll throw in one more. Uh, the supply of mobile home parks is going away about 1% a year. It's pretty much illegal to build these anymore. And about 1% of the nation's mobile home parks get plowed under every year. Wow. So again, the supply curve is shrinking. That's a very different dynamic than, say, apartment buildings or self-storage or any other real estate niche where they're always building more. Only mobile home parks uh, have a, a shrinking supply curve. And all those homes have to go somewhere. All those tenants will infill into the remaining parks. Yeah, I'm I, off my soapbox now. What's your next question? <laughs> why? So why why are mobile home parks going away? Why are they getting plowed under? Is it just the land is so valuable? That's part of it. But, you know, basically real estate is always being plowed under and put to some higher and better use. Uh, you see that, of course, even, you know, in Manhattan where they tear down fancy, you know, skyscrapers from the 30s and the 50s and they put in even bigger, even fancier skyscrapers. So that's a constant that real estate is always being plowed under and developed into something else. It's just that in pretty much every other niche of real estate, it's still legal to build more, more self-storage, more single family, more apartment. But we touched on this earlier because mobile home parks have such a bad reputation uh, and because all those homes are not improvements to the land, those homes all have a title uh, that trades through the DMV, just like an automobile. A mobile home will have a VIN number. So it's wheel estate, as we say. It's not real estate. It's wheel estate. <laughs> what that means is that there aren't very many improvements to the land, and that means your tax burden, what, what you pay in taxes, is relatively low. And a lot of municipalities, of course, also fund, say, the school system. And if, uh, you know, and there are typically a lot of kids that live in mobile home parks other than, say, some seniors parks in Florida. But in general, you tend to get a lot of families starting out, a lot of kids. That's a, a, a burden on that local municipality. And for it, they get relatively little tax revenue because there are no improvements to the land. So anyway, so there's several reasons there, the bad reputation, the low tax revenues. It's basically been illegal to build a new mobile home park for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, so the supply the supply is not growing. And then there's the normal development of, we guess, about 1% of the parks every year. So that's why the supply curve is shrinking. That makes perfect sense. I never thought of it that way, but it makes sense. And and people, you know, they're, they're like you said, when... As they shrink and the demand's not getting, in, doesn't seem to be getting any less anyway, especially if the economy does go down, we see a decrease. That's actually one of my hopes is that people will shift down to mobile home parks, but there's really no, like, nowhere lower to go other than maybe moving in with family or, <laughs> you know. Yeah, there's some truth to that. Uh, but again, once folks own their own homes, yep. uh, at least across our portfolio, we now own approximately 2,300 pads. Wow. Uh, you know, our average lot rent is a little over $300. That's a fairly affordable number yep. for people to pay every month, even in bad times. Uh, in, in our markets, on average, say, and most of our homes would be three bedrooms, a three-bedroom uh, apartment would probably be 950 
maybe a thousand in most of our markets. So we're helping folks live for roughly a third of what it would otherwise cost them to live. Um, so yeah, some folks may move down, uh, but really it's it's just a great on ramp for folks that you know need need an affordable housing solution, can't afford a site built house. We're their path to home ownership, and again, once they own it, their lot rent typically isn't 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 but a fraction of, of what it would cost them to still be a renter. Yeah, that's that's another thing I like about it a lot is that, you know, there's a problem with affordable housing all across America and it's only getting worse. And as we become more and more like, you know, the European style model of real estate, it's just going to get worse and worse, in my opinion. And so like the the whole gentrification issue and all that, like people are like the bottom half of the U.S. is losing their uh, ability to afford a place to live. So I, I feel like that helps with the demand and it should continue to produce strong demand for these mobile home parks. Someone wiser than I said, the poor are always among us. So yeah, there, you go. There, there you go. There is always demand for, for affordable housing. Something like 30% of Americans have $30,000 or less household income. Yeah. And that's really our, our target market. Yep. There you go. All right. So let's talk about, uh, because again, this is a selfish show for me, uh, transitioning these units, these half that I have that are not currently uh, there. I mean, they're just tenants. They're paying, I think, six fifty a month for rent right now. Lot rent is around three hundred. Uh, okay. They're paying around six, yeah, six fifty rent. I, I worry a little bit because all of a sudden, I mean, when I look at that, that six fifty number, and then I look at dropping that down to three hundred, I'm like, oh man, that kills a lot of my cash flow. Now, it, is it because I'm no longer doing the repairs and maintenance on that that it's actually going to make up for that? Is that the idea? Yeah. Right. So, factor in, yeah, do do. Two separate P and Ls, one for the land, your say three hundred dollar lot rent, and all your land related repair and maintenance. Run a separate P and L at your roughly three hundred and fifty dollar house rent, and back out all your repair and maintenance there. And then also allocate in something for your time, Brandon, because yeah. unless you've already got a staff there, you're getting started out. You probably don't already have you know an asset manager and a bookkeeper and other people on your staff. If you do, more power to you. You can just expense their direct expenses into it. <clears throat> but what I found when I got into this business, I, I basically was in a similar position to you. I was spending a lot of time. I was making money renting mobile homes, but I was spending, again, still a fair amount of, of repair and maintenance. Still, I was making money, but I was spending so much of my personal time on it. Um, you know, if I had not <clears throat> had if I had not rented homes, if I had just rent to owned the homes, I did both. I did anything for a buck. Yeah. That was the way I got started. You want to buy a house? <laughs> Jefferson's got one for you. You want to rent? Jefferson's got one for you. Um, <clears throat> but the rental tenants um, turn over a lot more. They're a lot rougher on the house. You could go six months or a year and think, oh, renting's the best thing. Then a renter is more likely to disappear in the middle of the night and you discover like, oh my gosh, there's $4,000 damage here. Yep. And you take that against your previous year's rent at three fifty dollars a month, you haven't yep. made any money at all. Yeah. You just won't know that for a year or whenever they turn over. Um, I'm not saying that, that folks that rent to own you know, always leave a home immaculate if they don't go through. We, of course, hope they all go through with their rent to own agreement, but they don't all. But my experience has been, again, folks that at least put down more money, you're probably going to want to take one to $3,000 down, down payment on a house. Folks that can come up with that kind of money just tend to be better tenants. They're more likely to, to go through and own the home. And if they don't, they're, they're more likely to leave it in better condition. So I would encourage you to only rent to own. You know, the folks that are in there and renting, just let them rent. Don't evict. Yep. But maybe you present them with the following option. You say, hey, if you sign this document, and maybe for the folks that are there, it's nothing down, uh, but you can say, hey, you can keep paying your, your 350 a month for the house. Again, sign a separate lease agreement for the 300 for the lot rent, but say, hey, you can keep your house payment at 350 and if you sign this agreement and agree to rent to own it, you take care of all the maintenance, then I'm going to you know, sell the house to you over three or five years. Depends on the age of the homes. Um, I'm suspecting they're older homes. Yeah, the 80s, I think. Uh, 80s? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so probably you do those three, three, 350 a month over even two or three years, you know. Um, or you can tell them, hey, or if you really, really want to rent, that's fine. I'll keep maintaining your home, but your house rent is now 450 They have to pay an extra $100 a month 
if they want to keep renting because you are maintaining all the proverbial leaky toilets and leaky roofs. So I'd present them with that option, let them choose to become homeowners or remain renters at a higher price. And you'll naturally have turnover over the, of the renters, no matter what you do with their rental rates. But anyway, then going forward, you only rent to own those homes. You never take in another renter and your park will naturally evolve over the next two or three years to be a, a community of all resident uh, owners. That's that's cool. That's exactly what I want to do. So, but can you explain the difference between why would I want to do a rent to own versus just flat out seller financing? Or is that the same thing in this case because they're DMV? Same thing. Okay. Because it's that's because they're DMV type vehicles. Like, yeah, just, just for a 1980s home in our community, these are probably metal, metal homes as opposed to the newer ones, which would be vinyl siding, shingle roof and look more like a modern home. But yeah, for the classic 1980s metal, metal, we'd probably sell those in our park with financing for about five grand, four or five grand, say, give me a thousand down and pay me that 350 a month, uh, maybe for the next couple of years. Uh, and then you're still going to collect what about seven, eight grand out of that house, or pay me five thousand cash, and you just own it outright. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the way we we do it. Put up a website, uh, you know, advertise on Craigslist, advertise in Facebook. There's probably a local for whatever town this is in Maine. There's probably a local sort of yard sale community in Facebook that'll pull. Probably also advertise in the local newspaper. You'll get those homes uh, uh, moved. I'm I'm making notes right now. Like, okay, I gotta build. I'm gonna build a website because that is one. Like, I'm across the country, so one of the beauties that when we put this deal together is that the guy who brought it to me, Ryan, lives in the town, owns a bunch of real estate in the town, property oh, manager great. in the town, right? So he's gonna be the boots on the ground there. So I'm trying to think, like, you know, what, what, how can I, I, how can I help? And I think I'll probably end up taking most of that as the website, the advertising, the pushing, you know, like that side of things. While he's there showing a unit and trying, you know, trying to collect rent when somebody doesn't pay rent on time. You know, that's kind of how we're segmenting a little bit. So, yeah, that, that cool. makes perfect sense. That's great that you've got somebody local and he can oversee the crews, yeah. uh, you know, because you will get some of the houses back trashed and you're going to need to uh, re-carpet. We prefer vinyl, but refloor the houses, repaint them. And he can be the guy getting a couple of competitive bids, overseeing the crew. Yeah. Uh, is he going to be on site collecting rent or do you have a, an on site manager for this park? So there was an on site manager. That person is leaving with the sale because she's going with the owner's other parks. I guess he's got more. Um, so right. we, we have to actually decide that That's a good topic of conversation. Do I bring in a resident manager now to live there or do I just say, you know what? I got this guy. He can take care of it. We'll just rent out that office unit as an actual house, make more money. Yeah, we yeah. There's no need to dedicate a house to be an office. Uh, yeah, so we okay. we always turn over houses to be just rent to own agreements. Uh, sorry, rent to own homes. Yep. Uh, frankly, we keep very there, there's in this day and age there's even very little for filing, very little need for filing cabinets. We scan stuff and Hoover it all up into Dropbox. Yep. Um, yeah, so I would turn over any quote unquote office that, that's a ha house on the property, turn that over to a, uh, to a rent to own unit. Frankly, even some of our parks have a site built office, some little cinder block thing, and we'll convert that into an apartment if we can. We don't like to rent, but you can't, that's an improvement to the land. So you can't sell off just, you know, j yeah. just that little physical office that you would have to rent. But yeah, we're always looking for revenue. So uh, I would put that back out into the rental pool, help some deserving family become a homeowner. Uh, probably then if your friend's in the town, have him collect uh, rent. Uh, we install a rent box, uh, just a big old metal, heavy gauge steel rent box, typically sunk in a yard of concrete. Uh, so no idiot can you know drive their truck yeah. into it and try and make off with all the money. Put a big old no cash sign on that rent box, only take checks or money order, and then just have him go on site several times the first week of every month, collect the rents, get them deposited. Um, and there are some other solutions out there. We use Rent Manager now to manage all of our 2,300 pads. I think that's that what Ryan uses as well. That actually tenant yep. portal. Yep. So if you want to get fancy and use Rent Manager, then your tenants can pay online right through that software package. Um, so you'll still probably have to go on site and pick up some physical checks, but maybe you'll see that you might start getting 25% of your, 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 your money coming in electronically. That's nice. And it integrates right with rent manager that way. And you, so that it kind of limits your bookkeeping a little because somebody, 
both deposits the money through the software and it automatically updates your accounting that they have paid. So there's no more reconciliation to do. Just that a thought, sense. Brandon. That makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, what, what I'm using right now uh, with my own rentals is, uh, and I don't know if they're even, they're still around. I don't know if they're taking on smaller clients like they did for me. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, Pay Near Me, which is a company where I can, all my tenants will go pay rent at 7-Eleven in cash. 7-Eleven yep. then de- deposits it into my account and the tenant pays a $4 fee. It's been yep. really, really fantastic for us uh, with our lower income tenants that we have in our apartments. So that's another yep. option I'm going to look into. Okay, yep. I thought I had read that that was a limit of a hundred units. I think like that's what I heard. I think that's units. what I heard too. Is that they they took a, like they added a minimum. I think um, which before unless when I signed Brandon up, Turner. unless you're Brandon Turner. I think I signed up before they instituted that. They probably realized that one off wasn't real profitable yeah. for them. <laughs> that's not no really more brand. Yeah, no more brand. <laughs> I think I had like fifty at the time, and uh, they it, it's been. It's been fantastic, and half the tenants like they just don't have checking accounts. I find that with low income people, oh, they sometimes, yeah. yeah, they just don't have it. So they go to Walmart and get a money order, and they would drop it in the box. But then our box got broken into once. We didn't lose anything. I, they just broke into it and then realized there was no cash. I think, and that was it. But um, I didn't want that to ever happen again, and so yeah. we switched over. And anyway, so yeah, definitely be implementing that online payments or pay near me if I can. So that's that's all good. Um, what else do I got for you picking your brain? Uh, Mindy, I've been hogging all the questions if you want to throw anything in there. You kind of have. I know. It's uh, like you act like, like my... this is your show. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is not my show. This is clearly Mindy's show. But Mindy, <laughs> I know you wrote down some questions here in our notes. I, what do you I did write down some questions. So my parents live in an RV and they travel around the country building churches. And nice. when they're at a church site, the church, it's through this big uh, group and the church has to provide uh, electric and sewer and water um, for each site when they're on site, but they're not always on site. They, it, it's a really long story, but they had to go, my dad had to go back to work for a few months and they parked their RV in a kind of a half and half RV and mobile home park. Yeah. Do you have any mobile home parks where you allow the more I don't want to say transient because it's not really necessarily transient, but you know, the RVs, the true RVs, not the mobile homes. Are there any benefits to that? Is that like a not cool thing? That was a great <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, so eloquently worded. Well, Mindy, I won't <laughs> refer to your parents as transient. Sure nice <laughs> they are. They're totally transient. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they don't even own a house anymore. They only own the RV. They've done it for wow. like 10 years and they love there it. Oh, that's total yeah. freedom. That's great. Um, okay. So RVs, uh, as you know, have engines in them. And as we say, th- those cash flows drive off. Whereas a mobile home is basically a giant box that gets permanently tied down to the land, big three foot long augers that go into the ground. It's a permanent water, sewer, electric, and gas connection, just like a real house. RVs are kind of plug and play. You just sort of plug in the water like a garden hose and you plug in the electric like a big old oven or something. Um, Anyway, so when we see a park, like we've got a great park in um, Superior, Wisconsin that came, uh, it's about 150 pads. There were about 10 that had RVs in them. Um, We didn't assign as much value to those pads. We felt it was still a good deal, frankly, even if those 10 RVs drove off the day after we closed. Fortunately, they didn't. Some of them did, and then some others came back, and, you know, uh, it was a little give and take. Um, But, yeah, that's a big difference between, say, buying a pure RV park, and this gets into issues of zoning and lot size. The lot sizes for RVs are often much smaller because RVs are smaller, so you can't always convert one into the other, again, for zoning reasons and for reasons of physical infrastructure. That's really a separate discussion. But we don't like RV parks as much, not because of the transients that come and go out of it. Um, But we don't like RV parks, again, simply because those cash flows drive off. And a lot of RV parks have people that are there for one night or two nights and may pay in cash. Um, And then, you know, who's there to collect all the cash? So, oh, that makes o- a lot of sense. Owning an RV park is a perfect business for someone like your folks who might someday just want to retire. They could buy their own RV park, live in it in their RV, and then they're there 
every night to collect the, the cash, to collect the nightly payment. You know that all the revenues are getting in the bank. It's a perfect sort of retiree business. It is harder to manage from a distance. Um, and again, always the cash flows are more transient, so I would not pay the same price per pad for an RV park at, that I would pay for a mobile home park. Um, but again, a little different business, a little bit more like the hotel business versus the apartment business. That's kind of the difference between RVs and mobile home parks. We like the more permanent cash flows. We like the, the, the mobile home park uh, model. But you can generally put an RV on a mobile home pad. And for instance, like that park in Superior, we have actually got more than 10 RVs in there now. So we didn't pay for that, you know, th that's basically free money to have some RVs move in for six months or whatever. We're happy to have them. As they turn over, we'll backfill with mobile homes that'll be permanent cash flow. But right now in the short run, sure, if somebody shows up with an RV and says, hey, I want to pay your lot rent and hook up, yeah, we're fine with that. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about the, the new fad of tiny houses? It's not really so much new fad anymore. It's it's a couple of months old, but <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I lived in an apartment with my husband when we were first married. It was 405 square feet. It was plenty of room for us, but these tiny houses are like 100 square feet. I don't even, like, how do you turn around? I, I'm not into that fad, but if that's your thing, I think it's awesome. So what is your opinion of the tiny houses? And can you put tiny houses on a mobile home? pad. I know people have a hard time finding places to park them. Can yep. you double up on a mobile home lot and put two tiny houses there? Like, how does that, how does that work? That might solve your problem of those empty lots. Brandon? That was like 20 questions there, Mindy. I don't know. Wow. Boom, yeah. boom, boom. Go. Just getting hit by Mindy's way. It's the Mindy <laughs> Well, it Brandon was show. hogging you I so much hogging. in the beginning. Mindy show. <laughs> okay. So here's a couple of things. Um, so tiny homes are technically RVs. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, they're, they're like wheels under there and they're not subject to HUD housing and urban development started regulating the construction of mobile homes in June of 1976. So everything since June of 76 has to have more insulation, can't have aluminum wiring has to have copper wiring. And I'm not saying that tiny homes don't have good insulation or have aluminum wiring. But my point is, for a mobile home to really be a, a legal mobile home and go into a mobile home park, it has to have been built since June of 76. Um, and it has to, it really has to be uh, of a certain size. Tiny homes get away from that regulation because they're so small. I think it's sort of anything under like 500 feet, uh, HUD doesn't regulate. So what you've got is a product that's not legally a, a mobile home, legally, it's an RV. If your city and county is really strict, they may prevent tiny homes from coming in because they're an RV and a local government could say, oh, sorry, we don't want transient RVs. You can only have mobile homes in your park. Um, it's rare that that gets enforced, but just understand that could happen to you. You'd probably want to talk to a local city official if you're thinking of growing a mobile home park with tiny homes, you want to make sure you can really do that because a tiny home is an RV. Um, anyway, so the other issue though, well, a couple there. So you probably couldn't put two on a single lot. That would typically violate zoning. You can only have one residence per lot in a mobile home, whatever it is, mobile home, RV, tiny home. You can only have one per lot. I'd be fairly certain most city and counties would start enforcing that if you brought in two or more yeah. on a lot. Um, anyway, and then the third thought that comes to mind uh, is that tiny homes really appeal to a radically different customer than most mobile home uh, park <laughs> dwellers would. Most folks, again, as we've touched on, are going to be making thirty to 35000 a year household income. Um, a lot of them have kids. They're just getting started out. Um, they, there's no way they could afford uh, a tiny home. Many of those are like 70 to a hundred thousand bucks. Um, and then furthermore, they've got two or three kids. The math just yeah. isn't going to work on a, in a three or 400 square foot footprint. So 
we appeal to affordable housing customers. They, they make 30, 35,000 a year. They want to get a three bedroom place, 1200 square feet for, you know, six, seven, maybe 800 a month. That's a, again, a very different market than uh, tiny homes, which tend to be driven more by retirees and specifically uh, eco-conscious uh, retirees Users. that feel great guilt about their carbon footprint and whatnot. I so. think you're. I think you're looking for the word millennials. You know, millen- that, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> hipsters, Hip- millennials, hipsters, millennials. Yeah. 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 I knew a guy who bought a tiny house, and he did not live in it long. Really? Yeah. I got a yeah, good so friend that's building very, it right now. It tends to be a more coastal thing. You see tiny homes, you know, yes. on on both coasts. You don't see them in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> but the concept is unheard of. There's that so much happen. land in Wichita, Kansas. That's yeah. funny. Yeah, I don't need this little bitty tiny home. One of my buddies is making a tiny home right now, and him and his wife. I mean, they're like 23 years old. They absolutely love it, uh, and they've been in it. For, he, he built a rock wall on the outside of it so we could climb the rock wall around the house. It's about like they're, <laughs> you know. Young I'm couple. sorry, like a climbing wall? <laughs> like a climbing wall. Like the fake stone. A climbing wall. Like a climbing wall. Yeah. Oh, not fake so stone. Mental. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it is very. Okay. Great. All right. So, okay. <laughs> it's their house. They can I do what they want. I don't expect yeah. to ever see them in any of my parks. No, no. Yeah. And, and the problem is that they, they actually have been sent is they can't find a place to put their tiny home. Like they're like parked at some guy's house right now, like with, the, you know, but they're not really supposed to be and they don't have, they don't have water sewer garbage hookup. So like. They have to empty a bucket and like, it's, you know, like it's yeah. not really a house. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's they're gross. living in a shed. Got no yeah. running water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they have to buy their challenge. own land. Yeah. You know, if they could get a half acre of land, improve it, put in a well, put in a septic and yep. put their house on their own quarter or half acre of land. Maybe that's a solution for them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, they're, it, it's a great concept, but it's not really a factor in at least the mobile home park world. Sure. That makes sense. I built a playhouse for my kids. There's electric in there. I mean, there's nope. not electric <laughs> in there. So it's wow. If it's if it's under 120 square feet, you don't have to have it um, can, uh, inspected. Per- permitted. Oh, inspected. it wow. is 118 square feet. Wow. Good and job. my I feel okay putting electric in there because my father-in-law is an electrician. Oh, nice. There for like go. a thousand years, and actually he did. Can I come so. when I am in Denver? Can I come hang out in your playhouse thingy yes yes. i don't need a hotel i'll just i'll just hang out there you don't need a hotel you could just stay in the playhouse it might get chilly i'll give you a blanket well you got to heat out there i'll just put a little space heater and electric there you go i've got electric yeah we're good good. brandon between mindy and myself if things get bad for you (laughs) you'll always have a roof (laughs) thank you (laughs) don't worry just call us (laughs) thank you so good to know Uh, this is like the best show. All right, so let's shift gears here because we talked a lot about mobile home parks, but some people listening, they don't really care about mobile home parks, but we do care about real estate investing as a whole. And so I want to talk about some of the things that will apply to any real estate investor, uh, specifically a couple of things that you're doing. One, when we talked to you last time, you talked a lot about, you know, I mean, you were building up your business. It was you and I think your partner and you were in there swinging in the trenches. Today, you've got kind of an operation going. I mean, you brought on team members yep. and all that. That is something that anybody, whether they're looking for mobile homes or whatever, when they want to scale, you have to bring in people. So can you talk yep. about like, what have you done in the last couple of years uh, to scale? What's your operation look like today? And uh, tell us about that. Yeah. So when we got started, as I call it, it was Mobile Home Park 1.0. It was Brad, my partner and myself doing everything, our own bookkeeping, QuickBooks and spreadsheets, putting our own ads up on Craigslist to market the properties, answering many of the phone calls ourselves. You know, we managed the properties. We've now gotten to what we call Mobile Home Park 2.0, where we've hired on folks that in turn do that. So Brad and I are managing not the properties, we're managing people that manage the properties. So some of our key hires, and by the way, we made most of these key hires too late. We did not really hire ahead of the curve. That is my biggest point of advice to your listeners is hire ahead of the curve. Uh, But we brought on um, a couple of key points here. Um, A controller, uh, a lady who's been uh, in the business of real estate accounting generally, not specifically mobile home parks, but she's been doing real estate accounting for more than 20 years. And that's more than enough experience. Um, but we've got, again, a, a, an experienced controller. So, so she what, just makes sure. Yeah, what does that do? Yeah, you're, yeah she you're makes sure that the books are right. Uh, so, for instance, you know, we buy a park. Okay. What's our opening balance sheet? Some of that is non depreciable land, but some of it is depreciable pavement, 
water and sewer pipes, fencing, signage. This is your opening balance sheet. So all that has to be logged in. And then, of course, that, that triggers uh, the correct amount of depreciation. At least we believe it is now the correct amount of depreciation now that we've got her working for us. Um, she also just makes sure expenses are coded correctly. So if I have to deal on an emergency basis with a vendor and you know buy $400 worth of pipe at Lowe's out in Wichita, uh, that shows up on my credit card. She'll pick through the credit card and say, hey, Jefferson, what's this $400? And I say, oh, you know, that's the Lamplighter Mobile Home Park. And, uh, you know, that's for piping for house number one, two, three. So, you know, again, get it, you know, expense it or put it in our, our, our books appropriately. Um, so she produces all the P&Ls, all the balance sheets, all that stuff that then ultimately goes, you know, helps us pilot our business correctly because now we know you know what homes we're making money on what homes we're not what the overall park profitability is uh so so that's what she does um and then ultimately all that goes out to our investors uh so brad and i obviously could be doing that ourselves we used to do that ourselves but now we have her so we can do other things with our time like find new deals to buy uh, anyway, so hiring on a controller was a key thing. Uh, and then in just another couple of weeks, we've got an accounts receivable person starting. Now, you wouldn't normally think of that as being a key hire, but the mobile home park business is really fundamentally a collections business. Again, we have approximately 2,300 tenants. All of them owe us, say, 300 bucks a month. So that's about a, a 600,000 a month run rate of rent that we've got coming in. We need to make sure that everybody actually pays. And, and the first line of defense is the managers to make sure that all the tenants have paid. But this accounts receivable person now still oversees checks, will oversee and check every lot. And for instance, make sure that, okay, we did get the rent paid. It was late. Did the manager actually enforce the $50 late fee? So a lot of it really is revenue assurance. It's above and beyond just receivables. It's really ensuring that we have a culture across our portfolio where the managers are in fact collecting all the rent on time or charging late fees and again, collecting those late fees if not. That's another key hire. Um, and then the third I'll, I'll, I'll mention is that we've hired on a lady to do all of our um, asset management. So she's been uh, a decade with two of America's top 10 largest mobile home park owner operators. Uh, so what asset management means, at least for us, is she's overseeing the reinvestment back into the properties. So Brandon, what you may find, for instance, with yours is, again, you've got some homes that need to be rehabbed. They're vacant. So are you going to spend three grand and do, you know, a so-so job rehabbing them, or are you going to spend five or six and do a really nice job? Uh, there's no right answer there. You just need to know your market and decide to what extent you're going to improve a home. Um, or your park, you know, may need to be repaved. So, you know, you probably want to get a couple of competitive bids because you're going to spend 40, 50 grand repaving. So those th that sort of reinvestment back into the property is, is what we call asset management. Again, stuff Brad and I uh, were doing, but now we have th this lady doing it for us. So again, we can focus our time on uh, a higher and better usage of, of our time. So anyway, getting our financial side of things nailed and then getting our operations uh, side of things nailed uh, has been basically what we've been up to really over about the last 12 months. And we probably should have been starting even almost at the time we had our first podcast with you a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but that's what we've been, what we've been building mobile home park uh, 2.0. We're about to bring on some other folks just to do home sales and marketing on Craigslist and in local newspapers and things. That's going to be a dedicated person that will do that sort of marketing and sales across all our properties um, can that anyway, person be, so that's, that's can that person be local to you or can it be anywhere in the country? I mean, just looking. Yeah, that could be really anywhere. Our, our finance people are down, uh, with my partner, Brad down in orange County. Again, I'm up here in San Francisco and our properties now are coast to coast. We own from Washington state over to North Carolina, down to Florida. Most but of it's not in Midwest. Maine. 
Not, not in Maine. Maine. Not in <laughs> not Maine. Yet. No. Run but, away. Run away from. I Maine. hear there's some new guys that just bought a perk <laughs> there, though. They may not know what they're doing. It might come up for sale in another three months. We'll see. <laughs> we will see. All right, <laughs> managers. What about uh, like you mentioned the managers having to make sure the rent was paid or you know like the late fees were issued? You have a manager for every park or wh- what is that? Yeah, we have a manager for every park, uh, and that's almost always somebody that lives in the community. Uh, and we look for folks that not only live in the community, but own their own house. So that means they're likely to be more stable, more committed to the community. Uh, and we look in particular for folks that have particularly nice homes. doesn't have to be a brand new home, but we're looking for a home that's clean, probably been painted. If it's an older home, we want their front lawn to be cut. Those are people that show pride of ownership. Those are excellent candidates for being your manager. Um, so th- those are the kinds of people typically that, that we look for. And again, in, in our world, uh, managing means collecting the rents and filing some evictions. It's n- not getting into asset management, all the reinvestment back into a park, uh, we handle at headquarters. Um, all the check writing comes from headquarters. We never give a manager a checkbook or even petty cash. Uh, all the investment in, in the park is centralized. They just focus on the top line of our business, getting the rent in the bank uh, and filing evictions as needed. That's our definition of, of a mobile home park manager. Okay. And do you pay them or is it like a deduction in rent? Do you actually give them a salary? It doesn't sound like that's a, a huge chunk of time. It certainly isn't a full-time job from where I'm standing. It's rarely full-time. Um, we You'd need to have a park of probably a couple hundred pads or greater to get to to full time. And the average size of our park is probably right around 100 pads. Uh, We did just buy a two-park portfolio in Wichita of 500 pads. And that is a full-time manager and several full-time maintenance guys. But that's a behemoth of a park, and it's institutional grade. It's it, it's pools and clubhouses, and the lawns are cut immaculately. And uh, that's a whole different ball of wax when you get up into a park of that size and quality. Uh, but yeah, for your typical sort of 40, 50, 80 space park, it's probably somebody on site. On site, we typically give them free lot rent, plus we pay them about ten dollars a month per pad. Uh, so Brandon, you've got something like 46 pads, so yep. they get about another uh, 460 a month in addition to free lot rent, and then we pay them an additional five dollars a month for any uh, park-owned home. So that might be you've got another 20 homes there. Brandon times five is another hundred bucks. So we'd pay free lot rent plus about 560 a month to a manager for a park like like Brandon's. Okay, and okay. do they do any of like lawn care or anything like that? And that would be additional work for additional pay. Uh, but yeah, we, we have a couple of managers that do that or uh, up in some of our parks in, 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 in the, uh, the upper Midwest towards the north uh, where we have snow plowing. Um, yeah, so we'll occasionally hire managers to do additional work for additional pay, but that would almost certainly not be included in their compensation. So is lawn care typically the responsibility of the person on the lot, or is that typically the responsibility of the park itself? Good question. That's typically the the homeowner's responsibility for their lot, but a number of our parks have like a playground area or just sort of a grassy area like near where the entrance is. It's often, it's common to find a common area uh, land in a mobile home park that needs to be paved. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry, it needs to be mowed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So I, let, let's talk about the. Although pave. you could pave it, and you then you have no more mowing. <laughs> well, I was going to ask about the paving thing. Have you had to redo roads inside of mobile home parks? That feels super expensive. Yeah, it is expensive. Uh, this was our park in uh, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. We knew this going in. Our, our our diligence was good enough to discover that a third of the pavement was basically gravel. Uh. <laughs> Uh, it had been really bad. It was probably badly done to begin with. It was on a hill. It was at the bottom of a hill. Uh, there was a lot of runoff. Anyway, so we knew going in that a third of that park was going to have to be repaved. And in fact, our bank uh, made us do a hold back, I believe, of $50,000 uh, specifically to get that paved. 
Um, so we did. We did it right. Uh, it actually worked out to be, I think, closer to a seventy thousand dollar expense. Um, that was that's about a ninety space park. So we were paving in front of yeah, roughly thirty homes. So call it yeah, somewhere around two thousand per pad was a rough ratio of what it cost, at least in that park, uh, to get it paved. Anyway, so we spent the seventy thousand. The bank then uh, sent us uh, the fifty thousand dollar holdback. They basically increased our loan by fifty thousand dollars and 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 wrote us a check back for fifty after we had photos and had proved that we had done the work. Um, so it's rare that that you would do it. Uh, I don't believe we've done anything other than some pothole repairs in our other roughly 22 parks. What about flood zones? When I was looking at buying a mobile home park, almost every property I looked at had at least part of it. And this one, even even like part of it in the very, very back might be considered uh, the flood area. So what are your thoughts on that? They tend to scare banks more than they scare me. Um, You know, keep in mind, most mobile homes are already mounted up uh, about 30 or 36 inches up off the ground. So a lot of flood zones are places that, of course, it floods rarely. And when it does, it might only flood four, six, eight inches. Uh, so you just need to look at it carefully and really say, what are the odds that we're going to have, you know, six feet of flood in <laughs> here? <laughs> okay. Um, and the odds of that are, are relatively low. That would be really only parks right in the dead, dead center of a flood zone that would ever get to potentially anywhere near that that high. Um, you know, you pray it never happens. Uh, but if it does, again, it's easier to repair mobile homes. You can, of course, if the worst happens, just haul it out and bring in a new one. Um, or maybe you're just cutting out the bottom foot or a couple feet of the floorboards around the bottom and you're redoing inside the house, you're redoing the bottom couple feet of sheetrock if that's what got wet and moldy. Um, So generally it's easier, I think, for for mobile home parks to recover than apartment buildings from floods. And again, you've got a much higher threshold, literally of about 36 inches before you really have any problem with floods in a mobile home park. That is a great answer. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, you know, when I was looking, there was, you know, there was one that I really liked. I fell in love with this park or the idea of the numbers of the park anyway. I didn't, never saw it, but everything was great about it until I found out that it was right next to a big raging river. And yeah, I looked at pictures. I typed into Google, you know, this town name and then uh, flood. And I just see picture to picture of like massive floods. I mean, like just like over the house floods. And I was like, yeah, no. Okay. So I left yeah. that one. Do not yeah. buy next to the Mississippi River, Brandon. That thing floods every year. I will. I will not. <laughs> I grew up so, next to the Mississippi River. I yeah, know then you know. Things. Yes. Yeah. Well. So in my town, we had a thousand-year flood right after I moved in. Huh? Right. Welcome. I was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I moved in. My my gutters were all nasty. I removed them. The next day, it started raining, and two days later, I'm at Home Depot trying to buy up every piece of gutter they have because it was awful. Oh. But there was there were two mobile home parks that are right on the river. And it was a thousand year flood. This place never, ever floods. We live in Colorado. We don't even get moisture ever. So one, one uh, park had about 12 pads in it and they just wiped out the whole park. They removed every mobile home and now they're going to turn it into, I think like a regular playground park and they won't allow them. They won't allow people to come back in and move in next to this river again, even though it never floods. Like this was such a freak occurrence. Uh, the other houses, the other flood, I'm sorry, the other mobile home park on the river was fine. It came up, you know, the 36 inches, but, or not 36 inches, it came up like 12 inches, but you've got the 36 inches, so yep. it's okay. But I mean, if you look at the river now, it's like four feet down from where it did flood. So we did get a lot of water, but. You know, part of, where I was going part of well, part of this whole discussion goes to like, when people buy real estate, like it's always, it's always scared me to. The idea of buying like one or two properties because freak things do happen occasionally. If like you put all your eggs in one basket, I'm going to buy, you know, one fourplex and that'll be my property that's carrying me to retirement. There could be a freak occurrence, especially out here on the West Coast where an earthquake, which insurance doesn't cover unless you have earthquake insurance, could wipe out one of my properties. You know, if I only have one thing. So when I looked at a mobile home parks, I didn't, I didn't even go into this business going, I'm going to buy a mobile home park. I said, I'm going to buy mobile home parks. I'm going to create a business and eventually create a fund or raise money and do the whole syndication model or whatever. 
because I don't want to own one park that could something freak happen and, and lose it. And I know you're kind of doing the same thing, Jefferson. You're actually doing a fund right now, right? Can you just talk about that briefly? Like, what does that even mean? And uh, how can yeah. that, how can real estate investors use that? Yeah, so we're just about to launch Park Street Partners Fund 3 uh, to go out and buy probably a dozen mobile home parks. Um, so it's it's obviously the mobile home park business, but it's a slightly different than doing individual deals when you invest in a fund because as a limited partner, your, your risk is spread out. You, you own part of 12 properties, maybe 15. We tend to buy nationwide so folks would get diversification across, you know, a bunch of different cities and states. Um, and that way, if you do ever have a, a whoopsie <laughs> and yep. your, your park floods, cash flows go to zero, or you discover, you know, hey, we've got toxic waste to clean up for half a million bucks, uh, you know, whatever your worst nightmare is, it would be rare that even then that you would ever have to go back to your limiteds to do another capital call. You've almost certainly got enough cash coming in, either just in the bank that hasn't yet been deployed, or you've got enough cash coming in from from existing properties that maybe you suspend your your, your payouts for a quarter while you deal with the issue. Um, but then you know you you resume you, you resume the next quarter paying out your your earnings. Um, anyway, so we we like funds. We think it's better for investors because again they get that sort of diversification. Uh, Brad and I like it because that way we know how much money we have in the bank and we know whether we need to go look for, you know, a couple of really big parks or, you know, maybe just a couple of midsize or smaller parks. We'll, we'll see what, what the fund turns out to be, but we, we like the fund structure. Um, I think it benefits both, uh, limited partners and general partners. All right. So let's say I want to build a fund. Let's say I'm going to make the Brandon Turner fund here and I'm going to go out and buy, uh, let's say small multifamily properties because I, I yep. like those, right? And I'm going to go out and buy, I'm, so I'm going to go start a fund. I'm going to raise $5 million from whoever I can raise it from. Uh, I have yep. to obviously register something with the SEC. Is that right? Or Yeah, you, re you, would, uh, you, you should. Uh, okay. If you're raising money from other than just friends and family. So yeah. if you're yeah. dealing with people you already have a prior existing business relationship with, you can do anything you want. Just form an LLC, write up your own operating agreement you know, raise money. But again, we've got, for instance, our own mobile home park investors podcast. We get 12,000 downloads a month. And and that doesn't mean we have a pre-existing business relationship with those folks. So uh, we've registered our funds with the SEC. It's a 506, I believe, Reg D uh, registration, which basically just means you tell the SEC, hey, we exist. Uh, and we're going to be advertising widely, like on our podcast, or you could even you take an ad out in the Super Bowl, whatever you want. Um, but in exchange for being able to advertise widely, you can only take accredited investors, folks okay. with a million and up net worth that's exclusive of their primary residence. So it's got to be a million or more of sort of other investment assets. Or they've got to make two hundred thousand a year if single, or three hundred thousand a year if married. Uh, but if they have either that net worth or that income, they don't need both. But if they meet one of those thresholds, then they're an accredited investor. And yeah, then you just go about things the normal way and, and raise money. But you can't raise money from proverbial widows and orphans. You, yeah. Folks have to prove that they are well to do and presumably sophisticated enough to understand the numerous risks from investing with you, Brandon. <laughs> that, make, that makes sense. <laughs> and that's kind of where I, I see myself headed. Look, when I looked at this one park that I'm buying, this is a test to me. Like, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm doing it flippantly, but like I'm, I'm doing this to see, do I want to get into the Jefferson Lilly model? Do I want to become your competition? You know, like, do I want to build a, a business around this? And I, I, I like the idea of it. We'll find out, you know, maybe I'll go into apartments instead if I find that I like those more, but I, I like that apartments have a little bit more competition right now. So, okay. So I got the fund. Uh, I'm building, it's the Brandon Turner fund and I register, let's say that, and I start building, I raise $10 million. So now yep. I've got $10 million raised. Do people then give me that money when like right away or do we wait till I have a deal or do they wire the money? When do I get the money? And when do I start paying interest on it? So that's all up to you. Those are all deal points to be negotiated. Okay. The way we do it is we start paying out a preferred rate of return right up front or we start accruing it. We'll actually pay it when we have profits. And Brad and I won't take anything out until we get our investors caught up and paid first. Okay. Um, 
But the way we do it is, yeah. So, so we, we, we tell folks, yeah, invest now. If you've got, you know, 50 grand or a million, whatever, put it in our fund now. Frankly, we don't want to have a deal lined up in a couple of months, go back to our investors and then have them say, oh, yeah, but, yep. you know, I found some other great deal. So I just I can't invest or I can only invest half as much. I'm sorry. Um, it's a little different when you're raising money from institutions. Uh, if you're raising money from, you know, like the Colorado public teachers retirement system, those folks, you know, can commit and earmark money for you. But frankly, your average, you know, John Doe who might just be investing five or six figures, if they see something better, they're likely to do some other investment. So we don't want to have to go back and chase folks down. We just say invest now. The fund is open. You'll start accruing your preferred return now. Um, some of those deal points may change with our third fund. Sure. We're sure. blessed to have a lot of people that have heard of Park Street Partners that are now hounding us by email, phone, and text wanting to know when our next fund opens. Um, we didn't start that way, believe me. Uh, but anyway, th those are all deal points. But I'd certainly for a first fund advise just accrue it, pay it out, get the money in the bank right up front and then go find a deal. You know what I love? What I love about the fund, too, is so I'm, I'm doing my very first syndication deal as well right now. I'm I'm a, I'm, I'm just a small uh, what do they call them? K K. KPs that key part. Well, anyway, whatever. Like I'm a small part of the uh, the general partner. I'm a general partner, but I'm a small part of it uh, with my yep. buddy Ben Labovich. So we're putting together a deal right now. And what scares me, or makes me nervous, I don't know if scares is the right word, is that exactly what you said, is that we've been putting this together for a couple months now. We've got all these people committed. We, I mean, we've overcommitted 150% or whatever it is to what we needed to raise. However, nobody's given any money yet. We don't see the money until like closing table and then anything okay. can happen. And that freaks me out, which is why the fun thing makes me sound, makes yeah. me, the fun sounds more fun to me. <laughs> yeah. Our, our first deal was that way. We were kind of scrambling to get the money raised and we had folks just send it into the title company. But at closing, we were oversubscribed about 50%. And uh, here's a little tip. Don't kick anybody out of your deal. Just scale everybody back. You want everybody yeah, still yep. in your deal so that presumably you do well for them and then they tell all their friends and they, they're a little upset that they didn't get all of their money in. It was only two thirds, but keep everybody in your deal. Don't kick anybody out to scale down. I love that tip. That's I never thought of that, but that's fantastic. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So when you say scale them back, instead of I say I'm gonna give you a hundred thousand dollars, you instead only accept seventy five from me. Yeah, not, and we just at closing, we them. send you back 25000 uh, bucks, and we send you a signed and updated subscription agreement that says you actually have 75000 in the deal. Okay. okay. Oh, that's really interesting. I like that tip a lot. I do too. I'm not even yeah. doing syndication deals yet. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I'm not sponsoring them yet. Yes, I, I like that a lot. Okay, so uh, now I've got this fund. Uh, how, how does it break down? I know this could vary between the deals, but... It, do I just pay? I mean, does this say, hey, I'm going to give you guys 8% or 10% period forever? Do you get a piece of all the deals? H how does that all factor in? Yeah. So it's all to be, they're all deal points to be negotiated. The way we've done our funds is we've paid out, uh, say, an 8% preferred rate of return. Uh, and we pay out 50% of all additional profits. Okay. Uh, so Brad and I have to return more than eight for us to get a split. The first eight goes back to our investors. Now, the way our fund works is that that's, you can think of it like a loan. So anything above the eight pays down their capital balance. And then if and when we say refinance and pull out big dollars, a hundred percent of that, of those big dollars go back to our investors. Um, so in the long run, which maybe is year three and four, by then our investors should have all their capital back and that 8% preferred rate of return goes away. It's like a loan that we've paid back, but they still own half the deal forever. So Brad and I have effectively at that point bought into half of the deal. They still own half effectively for free at this point. They've gotten all their yeah. initial investment back. And they still get half of all the profits and depreciation out of that deal. Um, that's the way ours work. The, the, you can imagine very complex situations with more complex 
waterfalls and who gets what amount of money between 8% return and 18. And if it's a more than 25% return, it's this, yeah. it's that. We try and keep our funds uh, simpler and aligned. For instance, we don't charge a management fee. Uh, we do take a 2% acquisition fee. But after that, our only compensation comes from that profit split. So we're very aligned with our investors. We've got to get them paid first before we're participating in any of that profit split. That makes perfect sense. Yep. Okay, um, I've go got ahead. a couple of questions about what you just said. So you said preferred rate of return and you said yep. preferred rate a couple of times. I'm not familiar with that term. Is that like preferred stock where different people are getting different rates of return? Or like what does preferred rate of return mean? Yeah, so uh, what it basically means is if you were to invest $100,000 uh, <clears> and let's say uh, our deal this year earned um, 15000 in profit, so you would get the first eight. There's your 8% preferred rate of return on your 100000 So now the, the deal made fifteen. We paid you eight. So there's what? Seven left. That we then split 50-50 and you'd get another $3,500 on top of your eight. So you would get $11,500 all in. And then Brad and I would get the other $3,500. We're dealing generally with much larger numbers than yeah. this, but I'll just keep it simple with 100000 I don't need your piddly um, yeah. little 100000 Mindy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's basically... And are you, but it's then, like the, Mindy, once we say the next year, we let's say we refinance it and we pull out enough money that we can pay you hundred grand, all of that would go to you. Um, now, it's just a 50-50 split. You've got all your money back. Let's say the deal now earns... 20,000 in, in the next year, you get 10, you get half of that, and Brad and I get the other 10. You've got all your money back, but you're, you still own half the deal. You're still getting a return of now half the profits out of that deal. What if you refinanced and can, couldn't get, let's say Mindy put the 100 grand in and you could only refinance enough to get her 50% of that back? You know, So now she's got 50 grand in. She still makes 8% yep. on the 50. Yes. Right? And then, the, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I had not heard you of anybody know, doing it this way. Four grand would be eight like percent on the fifty, 50 and then yep. split the remaining. Yeah, yeah, I think that's Brandon, fascinating. Brandon, you can do anything you want. You can do whatever yeah, you, you want. You can set yeah. it up however you want. <laughs> I'm going to set it up so I get a hundred percent all the time, forever, and the investors get oh nothing. My God. Can I do that? Can I invest? <laughs> Brandon, you, Brandon, if you can raise money on those deal. terms, <laughs> I'm going to listen to your podcast. That's <laughs> awesome. I will give a high five to whoever invests in that deal right there. That's wow, that's what I'll give. High go. five and zero percent return. Uh, exactly. Sign me up twice. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, one thing, and Mindy, I know this is your question. You wrote it here, but I'm going to ask it because I'm rude. You can ask my next question. But, rude. Uh, w do you have a time frame? So when you're going to sell these properties, are you holding them forever? We, uh, we do have a time frame. The funds are 10 years. What we found, Brandon, was that when we were talking to investors about investing, they all kind of wanted to know what the lifespan of the fund was. That gives them some surety that they will get their money back at some point. So we found it very difficult to go to the market and say, oh, it's an open, you know, the fund just goes forever because what your investors hear is I'm never getting my money back. <laughs> that's not the case, but that's what they hear yeah, if yeah. you don't say, oh, yeah, the fund has a 10 year life. Then investors kind of know, okay, at least after 10 years, these guys are going to be forced to sell everything and get me my money back. So um, we'd advise kind of anywhere between a five and 10 year lifespan. And you can always renegotiate, right? You know, when, when the fund is up, if, if all the limiteds are like, hey, let's keep the party going. This is a great business. You can always just extend your fund at that point and keep extending it if, if the limiteds are all, uh, uh, you know, if the limiteds all want to do that. So you still have the option to even take it longer if everybody's happy. But yeah, you'll probably need to put a finite life uh, on, on, on your fund, at least until you go public. And then, of course, people can always buy and sell their interests on, on, on the public markets. Um, Are you but thinking yeah, of doing of that? Being public, you, you'll probably need to put a finite life on your fund. Is that the plan eventually for you? Go public, do you think? Who knows? Um, you know, there, there's some talk of some other larger partnerships that may go public, and uh, that would set... Uh, uh, a nice path and precedent for us maybe to go public someday. Um, also, public companies tend to have, you know, stock that they throw around. 
who knows, maybe we get a very interesting buyout offer yeah. from somebody larger. We'll see. We're not counting on it, but there's a non-zero chance that something like that happens. All right. <laughs> Cool. A right. non-zero chance. <laughs> I like that answer. Okay. So I am going to, Brandon said I could take his next question. I'm going to read his mind. Uh, how are you <laughs> finding parks today? Brandon took forever to find his mobile home park. Does, he even me sent me, there was one in my town that was listed for $3 million. What was it? 20 lots? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was crazy. It was ridiculous. I went and drove past and I'm like, well, I don't think anybody got shot today. <laughs> <laughs> If That's actually, worth it's a million bucks in purchase price right there. <laughs> yeah, right there. Nobody got shot. So there you go. Brandon, is your property didn't get anybody, nobody got shot nobody in got the shot. last week. So no. there you go, worth We're a million. Safe. So how are you finding properties today? How are you finding these mobile home parks? Because Brandon takes forever. I do. Yeah. Uh, and Brandon, how long were you looking? It's been about two years. Is that it's it? It's been about yeah. two years. No, I mean, I, I, it was like... <laughs> So I decided I committed back January 1st of 2017. I said, I'm going to buy a mobile home park oh, this okay. year. That was commitment date. Oh, okay. Then That's I started so looking. It's been less than a year. It's been less than a year. I started looking and started feeling things out. And I will close on the 28th of December, 2000. Right. And uh, yeah, so it went down to the wire. Well, that that's awesome because it took me, I think, seventeen months to to close on my first park from the time I first got turned on to this space, you know, and things started clicking yeah. until I actually closed closed my first deal. So you're ahead of me, Brandon. Oh, good. Fantastic. Good. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, um, but you didn't have Jefferson Lilly to I, that's coach true. you along the way, Jefferson. So. <laughs> um, so we find parks a, a number of different ways. Uh, there is no panacea. Um, the most successful path so far has been brokers. Uh, we go to all the trade shows. We meet all the brokers there. Uh, we do other, of course, phone calls and emails and stuff. Um, <clears throat> for those big trade shows, we typically host a cocktail hour and we invite all of the brokers to come have, come get liquored up on park street nice. partners. <laughs> so all of that is, is maintaining top of mind with brokers. Um, so we've found that to be where we get most of our deals. Um, that said, we've also, we have bought off, uh, publicly available websites like LoopNet. Um, we tend not to pay the high prices that get listed on some of those public websites, uh, but where we can get a deal at a more reasonable price, say a third less, um, then some of those widely shopped deals can begin to make sense. Uh, <clears throat> we also do some outreach directly to park owners. Uh, we've mailed out postcards. We make follow-up phone calls. Uh, so that's uh, produced some results. Um, and then again, we, we have our mobile home park investors podcast. And for instance, our deal in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina came from a couple of guys that knew about this off market park for sale. They had listened to our podcast and they just called us up. We always are happy to, to partner or pay referral fees. Uh, I think we paid those guys something like a $75,000 referral fee wow. for that deal. I know uh, of a mobile home so, park in Longmont <laughs> if you're looking. $3 million. You can get this thing. $3 million, 20 spots plus a house. <laughs> we'll talk after the show. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you're, uh, you're doing a variety anyways, of there's things. There's no panacea. We, we do a little bit of everything. All right. Okay. All right, is there a particular size property you're looking for or that you won't look at? Like is something too small or too, it doesn't sound like there's something too big if you did a 500 lot yeah. property. Yeah. There, yeah, there's where we're at now, not to sound cocky, but there's probably nothing that would be too large for us. Okay. Um, so on the downside, on, on the smaller side of things, we probably would be looking generally for 50 space parks. Um, it would depend a little. It really depends how much money we can prudently invest. Let's just say a typical uh, a 50 space park on city water, city sewer in a decent Metro, uh, is certainly going to be 20 and maybe $25,000. So we're going to be investing uh, the total purchase price would be a million, a million and a quarter. Uh, so we'd be investing a quarter million, maybe 350,000. Uh, and then get obviously borrowing about 75%. Um, anyway, so that might be roughly what, what the low end would be. Now, if it were a really sexy park, like on the water in California, who knows? A ten space park might be, you know, a million bucks or more. It would be in California. Yeah. <laughs> so 
But anyway, let's just say for most of the Midwest, it's probably 50 spaces. That says it said if it's a market that we're already in, uh, places like Wichita, Kansas, uh, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, uh, now Superior, Wisconsin. We're in Lakeland, Florida. We're in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. For markets that we're already in, we'd consider something much smaller. It could be a 10 or 20 space park. We'd just sort of bolt it on to our, our property that's already there. Probably the tenants from the smaller park would pay their rent over at the larger park and probably the manager from the larger park would now just pick up an extra 10 or 20 pads to manage. Um, we've actually done that with our Tulsa. Uh, we've got two parks in Tulsa. One of them's much larger and that's the way we co-manage those couple of parks. So again, um, if it's a market we're already in, there might almost be nothing too small. All right. Okay. My, okay, my last question before we go to the fire round. Uh, are you typically getting 25% like down payment? Is that, is that typical for banks you're seeing right now and the fund provides that down payment? Yeah, we get financing from a number of different sources. Regional banks are going to be right in the sweet spot for sort of smaller and mid-sized deals. Let's say purchase prices of half a million up to maybe two million. When you start getting to two million and up, uh, those are big enough deals that you can get CMBS financing, collateralized mortgage-backed security financing, which is this fancy Wall Street debt that's better, cheaper, and longer than bank financing. You can also get some agency debt from Fannie and Freddie. The, the federal government or government-guaranteed agencies also do write mortgages on larger and typically middle to better quality parks. So it depends a little on, on the size and quality of your asset, but there are things other than bank financing that you can get. All of it's 70, let's say on average 75. Um, we got, actually we just did a CMBS piece where I believe we got 77% loan to value. Okay. Um, so sometimes you can do a bit better. And then of course, Brandon, as you know, there's always seller carry. That's yeah. all across the board. It sounds like you've gotten about 80% financing, yeah. which is great. And seller carry, you've got a really nice piece of debt there for your park. So, you know, anything is, is possible with sellers, just bond with them and, you know, find out what their needs are and see if you can work out something where you put down relatively little and borrow relatively long at a reasonable rate the way you have. So, yeah, one, one more thing I didn't mention earlier that helped with this park a lot that I'm excited about is, you know, in negotiation, which we just did a podcast with Chris Voss, who wrote uh, Never Split the Difference. Uh, and so I, I trying to use my negotiation skills. And this was honestly more Ryan Murdoch <laughs> than myself, but we negotiated uh, the price. He did not want to go on price at all. So we got him from 6% down to 5% for interest. We got 25 years with no balloon. And then uh, uh, we got him to take the first year and do interest only because there was some rehab to be done the first year. And so I didn't want to lose. So, yeah. so I thought, yeah. you know, after we had already come to terms with everything, we were like almost done with the, I mean, we were all on the same page. I said, I, it was like the last minute. Hey, hey, go ask if we do interest only the first year. That seems reasonable considering we'd lose money if not. And the guy was like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. So it made no difference to him. Made no difference. To yeah. us. I mean, they just helped us go from, you know, where we would have probably broke even actually the first year to now making an extra 20 grand the first year, just in interest. So yeah. Right. Was, yeah. So anyway, you can negotiate Great. all sorts of Good stuff. So, thanks, thanks. Yeah, that's I, and five percent. Like yeah, five percent is fantastic on a commercial loan for twenty five years with no balloon. That, that's I'm not going to get that from a bank ever, and no so. personal recourse. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I'll talk to. Uh, <laughs> you don't know if you're on that. the hook. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure I am going to be. On, I, I'm pretty sure that's going to be a recourse. Uh, the fact that we never talked about it makes me think that we just. I don't know. I guess I can negotiate that point now. I got a few weeks. All right. So let's go for no, no yeah. personal recourse. I'm going to go for no <laughs> norm for seller carry. All right. I'm going to no I'm personal gonna... recourse is the norm, but that's good. All right. That's different. good to know. This is, this podcast is all worth it right here. I'll send you your consulting <laughs> fee later. Um, let's, let's shift gears here and head over to the world famous fire round. fire round. It's time for the fire round. All right, this is the fire round. These are the part of the show. The, this is the part of the show where we uh, ask you questions direct out of the Bigger Pockets forums. And today, Mindy scoured the forums because she wanted to ask you some questions uh, about mobile home parks. Uh, go figure. So right. let's, uh, let's see what uh, Mindy has chosen for us today. Mindy, you want to start it? Yes, I do. Right. I would like to know how much I should budget for insurance on a mobile home park. And what am I insuring as the owner of the mobile home park? 
Great question. Okay, great question. So basically, mobile home parks are two different things, the real estate and the wheel estate, the mobile homes that sit on the land. <laughs> yep. I yep. love that term. So the real estate, <laughs> you don't really need to insure. It's very rare that, you know, even if you get hit by flood and tornado, it's, it would be almost unheard of that either of those events would actually like lift pipes up yeah. out of the ground or pull pavement up off the ground. So the actual ground, the real estate is virtually impervious uh, and, and we don't really insure it. There's, there's nothing, uh, the, the risk of loss is very sure. low. Now, what may get damaged, of course, is your cash flow. If all your tenants, heaven forbid, get swept away in a flood, or let's say their homes, not the yeah. tenants. <laughs> um, so you can get, and we do advise, and we do get, uh, I believe, one year's worth of business continuity insurance. Oh, I'm writing this down. So if the worst happens yeah, to one of our parks down. and our cash flow, everything goes to zero, that insurance company writes us a check for whatever basically last year's NOI was. So that makes us whole for one year. And then we scramble, of course, to bring mobile homes back in and try and get the cash flowing again. So again, don't insure the land. This is my my unprofessional advice. I'm not an insurance broker, <laughs> but I'm just telling you what we do. We don't insure the land, but we do insure the business, the cash flow. Now, for any homes that we own, the wheel estate that we own, you can't insure the tenants' homes. You can't not not the, legal the to insure resident. something you don't own. Okay. The resident for owned your, homes. For your own homes, we do insure those. I believe we get a relatively high deductible, which in this business is $1,000. So we're fully covered for all the damage to a house above $1,000. And it varies, you know, if you're in Oklahoma, it's going to be higher, call it a percent and a half of the insured value. So say a $20,000 home, would your insurance would run about $300 a year, uh, basically to, to insure that. Um, in, in places farther north, frankly, like Wisconsin, where you don't get very many you know, floods or tornadoes, it's, I think, closer to a percent. It would be more like $200 in a place like Wisconsin to insure a $20,000 used mobile home. Uh, but anyway, so we insure those for replacement value with a $1,000 deductible. All okay. right. What about uh, liability? You know, somebody trips and falls and do you guys, is there insurance on that kind of stuff? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So we do have general liability. I believe it is a total of $2 million per year, maxing out at $1 million per occurrence. So basically if we had two slip and falls, each with a million dollar judgment in a year, that would max out our insurance. Um, so far, thank heavens, we, we've had no such things. But yes, we do get general liability insurance again at, at, that, uh, at that level, one million plus one million, two million dollar cap. Okay. Do you have any and idea? Where, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask who does this insurance. Is that what you were going to ask too? Like, where do you I go to not. get this insurance? Oh, yeah. So there, there are folks that specialize in uh, writing insurance on, on mobile homes and mobile home parks. Uh, we use a couple of guys, Kurt Kelly uh, and Dan Greenfelder. Uh, we use mostly. We may have also dabbled with a couple other folks, but it's mostly those two guys. They both specialize in manufactured housing insurance, again, both for the real estate and for the wheel estate. That's okay. fantastic. I, w I was going to ask like for that business continuity, like, for a supposed hypothetical 46 unit property for around a million dollars. Like Jim, what's a rough estimate that somebody pays for that? Do you know, thousand, 10,000, 5,000 a year. Oh, I think the know? business continuity. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's on the order of a percent. Let's just say if you paid a million one, probably your park had about a hundred thousand in NOI. Yeah, I think so. So you paid about a 10 cap, 11 cap. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I would, I, I think that runs about a thousand, about a percent. So they're basically figuring the odds of getting hit are about one in a hundred, uh, something like this so is about, about 1%, I think. But it, again, it will vary with where you are n nationwide and what the risk is that your park maybe gets flooded or not. Obviously that insurance is higher if your park is or is partially in, in a flood zone. Um, but yeah, so just get, get, get a couple of competitive insurance quotes. And uh, we generally only deal with insurance companies that I think are at least like double A rated. 
I think AAA is the highest. So we're dealing with double or AAA rated insurance companies. So basically we can be relatively sure that they're not going to go out of business on us and not pay a claim. We, we don't deal with, with lower ranked insurance companies. Okay. Well, good, good tips. All right. Next one. Uh, I'm thinking of building my own mobile home park. Is this wise? <laughs> no, Bad don't, idea. don't do it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, unless you're telling me you've got, you know, vacant land provision to be a mobile home park, like in downtown Denver or downtown Chicago or some really major, <laughs> metro. you know, if you've got Sorry. that kind of land, frankly, you're not going to develop it into a mobile home park. Um, yeah. So what most people don't quite grasp is that even if you have all the provisioning, and again, it's very hard to get this these days, it would almost certainly be grandfathered land from 20 or 30 years ago. But if you, in fact, really can develop a mobile home park, let's think through the logistics. And we actually did a whole podcast on our show specifically entitled, Why You Should Never Develop a Mobile Home Park. Nice. <laughs> Basically, you go ahead, you put in all that money, uh, you're probably going to be spending 20 grand per pad for the land plus all the development. You have to put in the roads, probably put in sidewalks. You have to put in you know, water, sewer, pipe, maybe gas, maybe electric. Anyway, you're talking about spending, investing 20000 per pad. And what you have at that point is an empty mobile home park that's not cash flowing. Yep. That's not a good thing. So now, because it's so rare that people move homes into parks, you almost always have to provide them yourself. So now you probably have to come up with another twenty or thirty thousand dollars, maybe fifty if you want to do it really right. But you have to come up with say twenty to fifty thousand per pad to go buy used or new homes, bring those in, set them up, and, and then get get those on rent to own agreements. So most people don't think all the way through to the second part. There's no point in having an empty mobile home park. You've got to double your development budget then, get into the house business fully, own all those houses, try and sell them. Believe me, it's almost always easier to just buy an up and running, cash flowing park the way you've done, Brandon. Maybe backpedal out of the houses, but just get down to just owning the land, cash flow, buy, buy in place cash flows is my message. Okay. All right. Yeah, after. I got that question before we started this. No, oh, there you go. Good job. All right. Okay. Can you give me some advice on tenant screening for mobile home parks? Is it any different in your experience than for single family homes or apartments? Um, so I've never owned any other kind of real estate other than mobile home parks. So I can't be certain, but I don't think it's different. <laughs> Basically the way we run our screening is uh, tenants all, of course, have to produce uh, a driver's license or some, you know, some valid government issued paperwork showing that they're here legally. We check their background. We make sure that they have uh, no violent felonies in the last 10 years. If it's 11 or more years, we figure that's OK. You know, they've, they've been clean for a decade, um, frankly, doing dumb things like DUIs um, or even spousal abuse. We don't like it, but that's basically allowed. We just don't want anybody that shows a propensity to do violence to strangers, like they walked into a bank with a shotgun, you know? Yeah. Um, so for that kind of violent felonies, there just can't be any in the last 10 years. Um, we also don't take sex offenders. Um, that's not a protected class, at least not in the states that we're in. Um, I was just so, going to ask that. Can you discriminate against registered sex offenders? Uh, you, you can, or, or as we say, we can affirm that we want to build a community with, with no sex offenders. Keep in mind also folks that are sex offenders tend to have to stay away from kids and virtually every mobile home park has a lot of kids yeah. in it and the lots are 50 feet wide and the sex offender would be within 50 or a hundred feet probably of kids. And sometimes it, you know, they have to be farther away. I don't know all the, the, the regulations, but um, but anyway, so yeah, we, we don't take sex offenders and we don't take anybody that's done any violent, uh, vi has had any violent felonies in the last decade. Um, and beyond that, then if they're, they're clean, we'll look uh, to val verify their income. We probably want that to be at least two and a half times, maybe three times uh, the rent. Um, and so we'll verify that they're employed um, and then of course, we're also looking for that almighty down payment. Can they come up with say $1,000 down 
on an older 1980s house. It might be three or potentially $4,000 down on a brand new house. Um, but if, if you've run those background checks, they're employed, they're not violent felons, and they can come up with that kind of cash, uh, then they're likely to be a pretty good tenant, and, and we take them. There you go. All right. Okay. Number four. This is kind of a loaded question, but we'll see where we can go with it. Uh, from a new mobile home uh, park investor, I'm looking for some methods for due diligence when considering the purchase of a mobile home park. So sure. any, any, just as any insight for a new guy. Yes. So we've done two podcasts on exactly that. Uh, we've done one entitled On-Site Due Diligence and one entitled Off-Site Due Diligence. Um, so on-site, first off, you're going to do your, your off-site. You know, that's just like, hey, a deal comes across your desk. You're going to want to look up, for instance, what is the average house price in that community? Uh, we like to use a website called bestplaces.net. I love that site. Net. Yep, love yeah. that. So we can just put in, you know, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and boom, there it is. We see what the average house price is in that town. We like it to be 100000 or greater. We also look on that website to see what average household income is. And we like that to be $40,000 or greater. We'll also run a, a test ad uh, on Craigslist, and we like to see about 20 responses or more in a week uh, w when we put up you know, mobile home for sale. We'll have the seller send us like a photo of a home that might be vacant. We'll just run the test ad and try and drive traffic into their community. Um, and you know, who knows? Maybe if, if, if a home gets occupied before we close on it, you know, that's a good thing. Um, but anyway, so we'll run a test ad as well on, on Craigslist. Um, on site, then, we're looking to like meet a couple of residents casually. We'll typically drive through the park, roll down the window, and just say, hey, you know, can you tell me what the lot rent is here? And of course, if the seller of the park says, oh, the lot rent's three fifty, and the tenants are saying, oh, yeah, it's two fifty, that would be a problem. Yep. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so we're, we're looking to just validate what the lot rent actually is. We'll ask then tenants, just say like, hey, you know, so is the manager here any good? Um, now, understand there's like always that. tension there between landlords and tenants. And so it's not surprising when something's negative. Uh, but if it's negative, like, oh, that landlord, uh, you know, manager is always hassling me to pay my rent. <laughs> that's actually a good thing. Um, if it's more like, oh, you know, the manager is sleeping with some tenant and that other tenant, like they never make them pay their rent because they've got a personal relationship going. If we hear that kind of thing, you know, that that tells us probably all we need to know about the manager. That manager won't be continuing yep. uh, with us. So we do that kind of thing. We'll drive through competing parks in the town, just see how full they are, how well managed, what their lot rents are. Um, and then we'll also, for instance, just go into the police department and say, hey, you know, we're thinking of buying Sunny Acres Mobile Home Park. You know, is it is it a bad park? How does it compare to other parks? And usually the police say, oh, yeah, we're, you know, in there every month or so. But it's more domestic violence rather than drugs. And it's no different than any of the other parks, you know, so that we consider that a clean bill of health if we don't hear that, oh, it's it's the yep. drug park in town. Um, anyway, so that's kind of some of the stuff that we do on site. That's perfect. Okay, I find it I find it interesting that you actually physically go to a location that you're about to drop a million plus dollars on. What a great tip! <laughs> I'm, so I'm in the forums all day, every day at biggerpockets.com/forums, and I see people over and over. Oh, I bought this property sight unseen, and there were problems. Well. Yeah. Southwest yeah. Airlines is really cheap. You can get a round trip <laughs> ticket to almost anywhere from almost anywhere for under $500. Yeah. If you're even if you're paying $30,000 for a property, is it not worth $500 more to go check out that oh, it's a burned out crack shack. Okay, maybe that's yeah. not worth $30,000. Go um, check it out. <laughs> yeah. You know, I actually, that tip. I actually did debate yeah, it a little outside. bit. I debated it a little bit because I was like, well, I got, oh my you know, God. well, I was like, I got my partner, Ryan. He's there. He lives in the town. He can do it. Like he is the partner okay. that's on the ground, right? Partnership has seen it. That's yep. okay. Yes. But there since are I, somebody else's eyeballs. On correct. It, but. but since like I'm putting the deal together essentially and I'm bringing in a, a lender, or, you know, a, a partner to help fund the deal, I thought it would be good for me to do it. So I'm paying $700 for a round trip ticket tomorrow. I'm actually going there tomorrow to check it out. So. 
Anyway. Plus, you get to meet Ryan. And Plus, you get I get to, go to, to Bangor, Maine. I know. I've met Ryan yeah. before, but I get to hang out with him. Yeah, I'm actually staying at his house, so that's going to be fun. Oh, nice. Yeah. Does, so. so I was in Bangor this summer. You were. And I we heard. drove through. Stephen King lives downtown. Me He's and Stephen really... King are going to hang out. Okay, that's not true. Really? No. Oh, <laughs> that would be so cool. So, yeah, Stephen King has a really cool house. His uh, his fence is like bat wings and spider webs and like totally That's when cool. you drive down the house, the street, you're like, oh, there's his house. That's, That's no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go like look right for it. He's not really a low profile celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, he's I not. Here. <laughs> That's funny. But I was talking to Ryan. He said everybody kind of leaves him alone. That's funny. Yeah. So anyway, right, well, what were we talking about? Well, that was that that was the end of the the famous four. Now we're headed over to the. Well, I mean the fam- that was the end of the fire round. The the fire now round. we're headed over to the world famous. Famous, famous four. four. All right, the famous four. These are the same questions we ask every guest every week, and we're going to ask them to you, Jefferson. Number one, favorite. What is your current favorite real estate related book? Other than anything, I don't think you've written a book yet, have you? I have not. All right. So other than a book uh, you've written, which you haven't written, maybe someday. Maybe um, someday. Yeah, so Sam Zell has just come out with a book called Am I Being Too Subtle? Uh, It's a very good book. Sam Zell, for those who don't know, is chairman of Equity Lifestyle Properties. The ticker is ELS, and they are the world's largest mobile home park owners. Uh, So he's got, obviously, a publicly traded REIT, and he owns 150,000 pads. He's big. So a couple (laughs) couple more than you. A couple more. So uh, his book, I'm, I'm reading it. I'm not done with it, but I like it a lot. It talks about his background um, and his folks fleeing Nazi Germany uh, all the way through his rise, uh, going to law school, uh, quitting his first law school job, buying, I think, his first apartment building and just how he got into real estate. Um, so I would advise folks to read Am I Being Too Subtle by Sam Zell. Okay. What is your favorite business book? Non real estate related. Um, I really like Snowball. Ah, uh, uh, Warren Buffett. Of, of Warren Buffett. Uh, I think that's Alice. Uh, I'm trying to remember her name. Anyway, I've met the author. Um, but yeah, very good book. Very. Um, it, it doesn't just cover Buffett's business dealing and business thinking. It gets into, frankly, some of his personal shortfalls. He had some strained relationships, you know, w- w- with his wife and his kids. I think from time to time he was you know, very focused on building his business and their trade-offs in life. And I think that book uh, does a pretty fair job uh, highlighting not only his brilliance, but frankly, some of his weaknesses as well. So I I really like Snowball. Yeah, it's nice to see the, the, uh, I don't want to say downside because he's Warren Buffett. But I'm a huge fan of Warren Buffett. But Yeah, me too. It's nice to see that it's not all rainbows and unicorns. Yeah. All right, next one, Mindy. What are your hobbies besides buying mobile home parks? <laughs> now uh, I spend a lot of time. I now have three kids. I think I've had two, I guess, since we spoke last. So I've got two boys and a girl, and uh, it's just a ton of fun spending time with them. I took them, I think, yesterday to the playground for three hours and uh, just watched them run around and around. Well, not not my littlest girl, I, <laughs> but, but the boys. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, just spending time <clears throat> now with, with family. Uh, this is a fairly forgiving, fairly profitable niche of, of real estate and gives me a fair amount of flexibility to do stuff like that and just take off for an afternoon and take the kids to, you know, to the park. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. All right. Well, last question from me. What do you believe sets apart successful mobile home park investors or any investor from those who give up, fail or never get started? I've seen a number of folks get sidetracked. Yeah, they never get into this business. They hear one of our podcasts or, you know, they read a a book about this business and they love it, you know, and I'll spend some time with them. And then like I bump into them a year later and their story is, oh yeah, you know, I love mobile home parks. You know, I used to do single family fix and flip, but you know, the month after I talked to you, Jefferson, I found the best single family fix and flip deal ever. So I'm doing that. And then my buddy, yep. he found a good quadplex to buy. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But next year, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get out of that deal. And by next year, I'll be in the mobile home park business. So you can call that distraction or inertia. Um, but yeah, a lot of people who find this niche come at it, um, not the way I did. I came at it with, with no prior real estate investing. A lot of people have already done real estate investing, and it's just so easy to keep doing whatever you were doing 
because you know it. So right there, that means a lot of people fail to get into the business. Um, once you're in it, again, it's pretty profitable, pretty forgiving. Uh, I've only ever met a couple of people that really had like wipeouts, uh, like 100% loss of their capital. And in all of those those couple of cases, it didn't have to do with the park per se. It wasn't that, oh, all the tenants up and moved. It was that they like way overpaid and they couldn't make their debt service. Um, or one lady had a real sort of environmental problem in the town and the whole town's water supply got poisoned. None of that has anything to do specifically with this niche. Um, so if you get into it and you don't overpay, uh, then you're likely to do at least fairly well. And if, if you buy it right and you're willing to put some elbow grease and capital, as I think you're going to do, Brandon, into like rehabbing some homes, bring in some homes and infill some fully constructed vacant pads, uh, then you're likely to do quite well. You just got to break your inertia and distraction, get focused on this, get into it and start working it. That's such good advice. Such good advice. All right, Mindy, take us out. Mr. Jefferson Lilly, where can people find out more about you? Yeah. So we've got a couple of websites. Um, our, our company's website is parkstreetpartners.com. We've got information there, both for folks thinking about getting into the business on their own. We've got some resources there. Uh, or for folks that might say, hey, I just want to make a passive investment and co-own mobile home parks with these guys. We've got information on our fund there. And again, in early 2018, we're going to be launching our next fund and we'll probably do funds roughly every year. Um, then again, I've alluded to our podcast uh, that it can be found at mobilehomeparkinvestors.com. They'll find links to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, I believe also Google Play. We also have their links to our LinkedIn group. Uh, we've got a group of almost 4,000 people. It's the biggest of its kind on LinkedIn trading tips and tricks. So join our LinkedIn group. And then finally on that webpage, we also have a link to our calendar. We try and put in the big industry events and some of the public company earnings calls so people can just sync uh, uh, our mobile home park investors uh, calendar right into their mobile phone or computer and be abreast of upcoming industry events. So there you go. The, the podcast, the LinkedIn group, and the calendar all at mobilehomeparkinvestors.com. Perfect. Brandon, we should go Perfect. to some of those industry events. Get a, I should. Get a get liquored up to the <laughs> get liquored up <laughs> hey, by Park, Park Street, Street Partners, Partners is buying. It's yes. Vegas. <laughs> That's coming up in April. We'll see you there. That's awesome. <laughs> is it in Las Vegas this year? It's in Vegas. Usually the last weekend of April is the big show in Vegas. And then there's also a very good, slightly smaller show in Chicago, usually the first week of November. So we're always at both those. Those are the MHI events, which stands for Manufactured Housing Institute. And that's our industry's big nationwide lobbying group, obviously trying to get things passed or uh, undone like Dodd-Frank in Washington, D.C. And again, all, all the annuals. So, yeah, check out. I think it's just MHI.org. Um, so I, I would also advise for, for folks, you don't necessarily have to join that prior to buying your first park, but maybe once you you have, you might want to at least attend some of the events and maybe join that uh, that 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 national group. I love it, <clears throat> Brandon. I, I I just might do that. All right. Well, <laughs> Jefferson, this has been fantastic. Like really, really good. So uh, I'm definitely gonna take a like. I mean, I have like a million notes, but I'm gonna take and apply into my life. Right. I hope people do too. So <laughs> yeah. And Thank you. you. Whatever your next deal is, Brandon, you can call. We might pay you a referral fee or we'll partner with you on it. There we go. We're open for business at Park Street Partners. I like it. I like it. All right. Thank you, Jefferson, very much. And we will Thank see you, you around. Thank you, Jefferson. All right. That was a fantastic show. I felt like it was totally selfish, like most of these are, but you know, yeah, it kind it. of is. Yeah. I, isn't that why you started it? You that's, wanted to ask people direct that's questions. That's why I started Bigger Pockets back when I was seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that. Uh, you know, the podcast. Yeah, that's me being selfish and greedy. But hopefully, you guys can learn something as well. And for those people who stuck with us for the entire hour and a half long interview, uh, you guys are awesome. So thanks for thank hanging you. around. Anyway, Mindy, Brandon, I'm excited to you. do this mobile home park venture with you. I'm very excited. This is really awesome. 46 mm -hmm. units yep. is. It seems like a nice size, but not overwhelming size. I agree. It feels like a good. Twenty of them are already. 20 of them are already owned by somebody else. So we don't really have to do much with that. Yep. So I'm kind of excited. I'm not kind of, I'm really excited, but it's been a long day.
It has been. All right. It's well, it's been a really long show. <laughs> thank it has you. Been a long show. Thank you for letting me step in. Yeah. Anyway, all right, guys. Thank you for being a part of BP. Come follow us over on social media: uh, twittercom pockets, facebookcom pockets, instagramcom pockets. and uh, you can find me and Mindy on those sites as well. So search around. All over. All over. All right, guys. Thank okay, you so much for being you, a part Brandon. of Bigger Pockets. And bye, Mindy. It's been a fun. Bye, for biggerpockets.com. My name is Brandon, and this is Mindy. Signing, signing off. off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from biggerpockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.